Hello, and welcome to episode 27 of the Power Score LSAT podcast. I'm Dave Kalorn in Napa Valley. And this is John Dinning in Los Angeles. And today we're going to continue on with our conversation about flaw in the reasoning questions and most particularly common flaws. That's right. So this is part three. We've already done parts one and two. And uh, for this particular occasion, I have chosen to drink today a (laughs) painkiller. You could actually put, I have chosen to drink, comma. Comma. (laughs) I've chosen to drink today, yay. And then it is a painkiller that I'm drinking. Yeah, those are two separate sentences, perhaps. Yes, they are. Um, (laughs) What about you, man? I've got so many potential guesses. Oh, not me yet. No, you got some (laughs) splaining. Well, I'm not done. (laughs) No. So many guesses as to what pain you're trying to kill. Why why a painkiller? Um... The only real reason for it is that actually my daughter's sick today and I felt bad oh. for her. So she uh, she had to miss school. She doesn't feel well. It's the usual childhood syndromes that you get when you go back to class and you have a bunch of germy kids around. Gotcha. I didn't know if it was a weather change thing up there. I know sometimes the allergies are brutal where you are. I think it's everything. The weather, the allergies, the weather's just – the temperature's precipitously dropped. It yeah. rained yesterday, which is extremely rare in the late summer and not typically desirable for wine production, although it was such a light rain, it won't have any problems. That's good. It's all those things and she's prone to it, so. Yeah. Well, here's a segue for me, speaking of wine production. I, (laughs) Instagram suckers me in with their stupid ads sometimes and they got me again about two (laughs) weeks ago on some wine club thing where you pay X amount of money for six wines a month and they just ship them out to you. Anything that can be delivered to me to drink, I'll pretty much sign up for. So I signed up for this thing and got six bottles of red wine delivered to me on Friday. It just opened the first uh, this afternoon. So I'm drinking some completely random, unheard of label of red wine and it's it's not bad. It's not you bad. Know. The good news for you is that I'm actually about to ship you some exceptionally high quality cab and Syrah. So. Great news for me. You know, I thought I was excited better. about getting an iPhone this week, but you just <laughs> you just topped it. Oh, did I? Yeah, I think wait, so. Wait until you see the bill. <laughs> oh. All right, so this is not a courtesy wine shipment. It never is, man. <sighs> well, it's these ones. Uh, the price is higher. The, the quality is okay. exceptional. I know it is. It's all right. I'll I'll mix it with this garbage wine that I'm drinking, and it'll level out. Yeah, no, that's not how it works. Don't do that. That's not the blending trials that we talk about. <laughs> We're trying to improve the quality, not Fair make it go lower. Fair enough. Uh, I'm well, excited for that. I'm excited for this uh, this new batch that you guys have coming. If you guys don't know Dave's wine company, is it fencepost.com? Nope, it's fencepost-wines.com. Gotcha. Well worth checking out, um, whether you're a high-end wine snob like Dave or a complete unsophisticated Luddite like me. Philistine, <laughs> you will enjoy it. I'm not a wine snob. I, I know, just, you just know what you're I doing. I like wine. You just know what you're doing. Mostly, I, mean, I like drinking. Yeah. yeah. But on a musical front, mm. today we're going to pay uh, homage to <laughs> Rick Ocasek, who uh, unfortunately was found dead this weekend in New York City and apparently has died of heart failure. But he was the lead singer of The Cars, That's a right. band that probably for most of the listeners, uh, I would say it predates them. Mm-hmm. But it's also the kind of band that when you start listening to their catalog, you begin to realize, man, I've heard all these songs before. They they were certainly the soundtrack of the early 80s, um, as much, if not more so, than, than any other band. Mm. And so the song actually ties in with our discussion of flaws. And the song itself is Dangerous Type, which is probably not my favorite song by them. It's probably like third or fourth, but it's so perfect with flaws. Yeah, that thematically, it's hard to beat. Yeah, yeah, just you have to say yes to it. So <laughs> it's a cool song. Definitely check it out. If you've never heard of them before, if you've never listened to any of their stuff, listen to a few of the big hits. They're actually really catchy. And uh, for some people, they just love them. They were yep. never my favorite band, but I always appreciated their ability. So, a yeah, quality, they were a big uh, deal for a long time. Oh, yeah. He, uh, they have multiple albums with uh, multiple number one hits. He was married to that supermodel for a while. Paulina Porizkova. There you go. That's how you know the cars were a big deal. As a guy who looked like Rico Kasich <laughs> landed Paulina. Are it's you... like when Lyle Lovett and Julia Roberts got together. I was like, this Lyle Lovett must be something. <laughs> That's outstanding. Yeah. What a great comparison. I know. And very true. What's um, happening here? Look, Rico Kasich, everybody was like, 
He was a super cool guy and apparently incredibly nice. But Paulina Poroskova, like, he was out hitting, uh, he was out kicking his coverage yeah, there. Dude, for sure. Put it that way. <laughs> so, anyway, on that note, there now that go. he's gone, thanks. We've just kind yeah. of impugned Let's his name. Gets bummed out. Let's move on to the LSAT world. Something less of a bummer because there is a test coming up. Uh, and I'm sure some of the listeners here are gearing up for it. In fact, yes, in just a few a days. September test on Saturday, if you're taking the regular administration, um, maybe a little bit later if you're taking an accommodated test. I've been asked this, so I'm just going to put a point to it right now. Accommodated testing is often done a day or more later than the regular exam. I've been asked this question at least five times over the last couple of days, where people are like, is this a mistake? Should I call LSAC? My date's not Saturday. It's normal. It's totally fine. Yeah, it's because it's, uh, it takes them more time, special situations that they have to deal with. So if you are an accommodated test taker, uh, don't be surprised if it's not the same day. Sometimes yeah. it is, but often it is not. Yeah, it could be up to six or seven days later, in fact. And yes, you may, in fact, get the same test as everybody else. The chances are pretty high. Uh, there is some variation on that that we see where sometimes it's not the same, but especially with a released exam, chances are pretty good you're going to get the same exam as everybody else. That's right. So do- let, me, uh, let me make then two podcast, past podcast recommendations for people. One, if you haven't listened to our crystal ball episode that talked about September, November, uh, September, October, November, go check it out. It'll tell you what to do, not just for the September test, but beyond. Uh, if you have listened to that, you should at least know what to prioritize in these final days. And you can couple that really nicely with episode nine, which was all about test week, where we are, preparation. So two episodes that are very relevant for where you are right now. And I second that recommendation. Wonderful. Surprise, surprise. Surprise, surprise. Well, you were a part of both, so I hope you're good, hope you're good with them. And the cool thing is this episode is actually great for those of you who are preparing for this test because it will just kind of throw some of these main flaws that you might see in either the stimulus or the wrong answer choices, yeah. just back into the mental mix, give you a few examples to kind of contemplate and just keep you really current with it and allow you to feel more comfortable. I mean, the whole mm-hmm. thing is, is you want to walk into the test feeling as good as possible. That's what this whole process is about. That's what we're trying to do here. So let's get to it, man. Yeah, let's man, start let's talking dive right in. Flaws. I always think about these flaws in terms of comfort, really, because if you can know at least what you're most likely to encounter in terms of traps or errors or argumentative mistakes that authors make, it really sets you up nicely to, to pick apart the vulnerabilities, whether it's weaken, whether it's flaw to describe them, or even something like strengthen or assumption, where you're trying to maybe patch these things back together. So these flaws are really useful across the board, as we talked about the first episode in this series on flaw. That's exactly right. And if you think about it, well, is it worth the time? Let's just say that one (laughs) question that you saw in logical reasoning on the the LSAT that you're taking is something that you recognized and you learned about in the last week before the test. You'd feel fantastic about yourself at that point. Be like, I learned that and there it was. And yes, there's an element of chance to that, a very high one. But at the same time, what a fantastic thing for you because you've just gotten really what accounts for a free point there. For sure. Yeah. For what, an hour of time listening to the two of us? That's not so bad. Ah, we're pretty entertaining. Well, no, I just meant that the time itself is not so bad. Listening to us, I don't envy anyone. <laughs> well, I'm pretty entertaining. You're all right. <laughs> all try. right. Let's go with the first one. One yeah, of my man. favorites. Mine too. This is what we really call errors of composition and division, and we put them together. Although a lot of times when I'm talking about this, I don't use composition and division, although those are the formal names. Mm -hmm. I use part to whole and whole to part because that's what these errors are about, is making a mistake where you are taking either something about the part and trying to make an inference about the whole, or you're trying to take uh, information about the whole and attempting to infer something about each of the individual parts or one of the parts. That's right. Yeah, misattribution kind of up or down. Exactly. So what we want to do is break it into the the two pieces here quite sure. naturally. So we'll start with what's called the error of composition, which is the part to whole flaw. And this occurs when an author takes something about the part of the group and says the nature or characteristic of that part is something that I can use to then draw a conclusion about the whole or every member of the whole group. So, again, you take the part and then use that to draw an inference about the whole. 
Right. And sometimes when we talk about this, the first reaction people have is, well, why is that a problem? If all the pieces have a certain characteristic, doesn't the whole automatically have that characteristic? Yeah. And it does not. I mean, it's a natural question to ask, but it's oftentimes, I think, well served by having some examples that you can think about and be like, oh, I see what the problem is. It's the case for a lot of these flaws is they're not self-evidently mistaken, but once you see them in action, the mistake reveals itself. Yeah. And so what we're going to do throughout this episode is we're going to toss out examples that are usually more real world as opposed to LSAT world. I think trying to, you know, creating the examples isn't hard for us, <laughs> but at the same time to create them in an LSAT mode would be boring to listen to and boring for us to recite. We could do it, but why? I'd rather create something that's a little bit more fun. So from a part to whole standpoint, one example that I'll throw out there is, mm -hmm. all right, and here it is. <laughs> I went to a great party last night, so overall, I must have had a great day. Now, when you hear that at first, you're like, okay, I went to a great party last night. You had a great topping night. Fantastic. Mm -hmm. But does that automatically mean that your whole day was great just because the last part of it was great? No, it does not. You can't make that judgment right there. And so that's taking something about the part and trying to say that the whole actually has that same characteristic, and that is problematic. Yeah, yeah. And you see this in the – it basically has to be compartmentalization within these ideas, this nesting doll effect where you know something about the smallest doll, so you try to go outward, you know something with the largest doll, and you think you can apply it inward. In this case, there's a small part of your day that was great, but does that necessarily mean your entire day was not necessarily? Um, let's, do, let's do a few more. You do one. Sure. Um, my buddy, who works at Company X, is really struggling financially. He can barely make ends meet. So they must underpay their employees, or so everyone he works with is struggling financially. Okay. One employee has this characteristic at this company. It must hold true for all their employees. Okay. You can extend that, too. You could say, um, my friend is, um, is really struggling, and I know that all of his friends are struggling, and therefore, I can conclude that the company must be struggling as well. Right, right, right. See how we can stratify this up from a friend to his coworkers, from the coworkers to the company. Yeah, and those are the two company's separate really examples. struggling, so this economy must be doing really badly. You can keep going. Levels and levels. That's right. But that's it's what you need here. You need levels. Yeah, and that's that's what's happening because you need pieces, and then you need holes, and so that allows for levels quite naturally. Mm -hmm. And in each one of those cases, you are taking a piece of it and saying these characteristics then transmit, and I'll say upward. In this yeah, case, yeah. To the actual whole. From the and small that, to the larger. Yeah, that's not something that can actually be done. Now, when you see that on the LSAT, it's actually not uncommon to encounter this either in a stimulus or in an answer choice. Yeah, this is arguably, this combination of flaws is arguably the biggest one we'll cover today. Certainly yeah. one of the two biggest. And I'll give some examples of, of how they describe it on the LSAT. Okay. Um, assuming that because something is true of each of the parts of a whole, it is true of the whole of itself. Mm -hmm. I think that's probably the, the best way to characterize this. Notice how formalized that sounds. And I think this is one of the challenges of, of uh, flaw in the reasoning questions. Sure. Is that you might understand it intuitively or on a really basic level and be like, I've got this. And then you read the way they've described it and you think to yourself, what did they just say? I don't know. And you have to fight through their very formalized, abstracted version That's of right. what is something that you really can understand quite clearly. Yeah. We talked about this in the very first episode on flaw that we did several weeks ago in the discussion about the value of knowing these common flaws, that really knowing was a two-part knowledge. One, you have to know the flaws themselves, but two, you have to be able to pair them with the LSAT's overly formalized description of the answer choices. That's the key if you want to really get the point here. It's one thing to be like, ooh, that's a composition error. But if you don't know how they're going to describe it, and they're not going to use composition error, answer choice B, <laughs> then you're only halfway home. Yeah. Here's another example, and then we'll move on to the other okay. part of this flaw. It takes the belief of one member to represent the beliefs of all members. And, you know, a really easy thing to apply to something like politics, for example. Mm -hmm. So when you look at that, again, just because you know what one member of a group thinks, that does not mean that you know what all members of that group That's right. think. Yeah, Bernie Sanders believes, so Democrats must think. 
Yeah. Donald Trump thinks, so Republicans <laughs> think. Each side accuses the other of this flaw, by the way. They're like, you I'm all laughing believe that. because your flaw was that Donald Trump thinks. <laughs> <laughs> cheap shots. Sorry. Uh, you love a cheap shot. I, it's my favorite shot. And whiskey, but then cheap. Well, I will say this cheap just so whiskey. nobody is uh, unclear on my political positioning. <laughs> I dislike all politicians. Me too. I think they're all fake and uh, they're all out for their own interests. There's very few that, that aren't. And uh, that's pretty much all I have to say about that. Yeah. Even as Switzerland as that was, there's somebody who's going to be upset about it. Oh, that's okay. I know. I can't accept that. I just, you know, on both sides, I find that there's just a lot of politicians who have questionable motives. Yeah. That's why we keep and bringing them up in these flaw discussions, frankly. We love it. That's great. Yeah. Let's talk about the flip side of this, the sibling event that happens when you start to move from the larger component down into its elemental pieces, as it were. The so-called era of division. That's right. Or hold apart, as you phrase these. Exactly. So now this is going in the reverse way. Whereas I said we moved up a level or we went upwards last time, now we're going downwards. We're taking something that we know about the entirety and trying to apply it to a member or each of the members, mm -hmm. which is equally false. Um, so I'm actually going to use an example that relates to Charleston. Yeah. Close to home for both of us. Yeah. So there's a, there's a total dive bar on East Bay street called Big John's Tavern. Past tense. They, clo they closed. No. Yeah. I think they closed in 2013 actually. Well, thanks. Sorry. There man. used to be a there total used to dive be bar. A total dive bar. <laughs> if you're worried that Charleston doesn't have dive bars, you're in great shape. Don't worry. There's still plenty, but this particular one shut down years ago. That is funny because I did not know that, I but I will say out. this. Yeah. I couldn't stand that place. Is that where they put the green door or whatever? Yeah. Okay, yeah. Yeah. I think they had a fire and all that happened. Um, you may I not, did not like this. that bar. I remember walking by there like uh, around Christmas to what you're about to say. They actually had a Christmas tree decorated entirely with Grand Marnier mini bottles. Yes. And that is actually what spurs this example. Yeah. So I will come back to the Grand Marnier <laughs> reference, but – this is the example of going from hold to part. This bar sells more Grand Marnier than any other bar in America. Carlita goes to this bar all the time, so she must drink a lot of Grand Marnier. Or love Grandma. Whatever. Yeah. Something where she must Something. be really into it. Now, the funny thing was is uh, you actually, you, you know, Maria Wood, mm -hmm. who used to work for us, who is a she was then a liquor representative for Southern. Mm -hmm. And that Grand Marnier tree that they had in there, they received because I think they were in the top three nationally in sales of grandma. And I remember when she told me that we we're actually at Big John's Tavern at yeah. like one in the morning. And I was just floored by that fact. Yeah. And I helped. So <laughs> <laughs> I, I don't even did. like grandma, but if you went in that place, you had to. I rare I I just didn't go there that often, so I do not lament their closing. It's a classic bartender shot, is what that is. Yeah, I guess so. Big John's Tavern. Well, either way, that that kind of inspired that uh, example for me. <laughs> but it's just like because just because Big John's was selling a lot of grandma does not mean that every single person in there was drinking it. Right. I know that when I was there, I wasn't. Yeah. So maybe. Maybe not more than a shot. Let's put it that way. I'm sure Maria bought me one. One was pretty much obligatory. That was like the cover charge. <laughs> God, that place was grimy, dude. Uh, I felt so at home. That's exactly right. Here's another example. Do it. Uh, Akira belongs to the richest sorority on campus. Therefore, Akira must be rich. Again, just random kind of like collegiate example, right. just because all the house itself, the sorority itself is wealthy doesn't mean that each individual member is wealthy. Perfect. So that is, I think, an easy one to grasp though, part to whole, hold to part. This one takes the whole of it, in this case, the sorority or bar, and then says <laughs> an individual member, either Carlita or Akira, must have these certain characteristics. Yeah. Yeah. Ford did a car recall on the Taurus because they were exploding, your Taurus is going to explode, that kind of thing. It's like anything that encompasses a big group where you want to take a single piece out of it or a smaller portion of it and apply the characteristic down. That's what this is. To me, I think this is actually an easier one to spot and deal with than the other one. What do you think? I'd say so. Just because it's so easy to think about the idea of just because of a whole having a characteristic. Yeah. 
I would agree with you on this. Yeah. Um, what does this sound like as an answer choice? Okay. So the part to hold would, uh, or the hold apart rather, hold apart. would sound something along the lines of presumes without evidence or warrant that what is true of the whole is also true of each of its parts. Yeah. And it's funny, your car example made me think of, of a, a, a part to whole flaw that my wife and daughter make all the time. Okay, let's hear this. Yeah, this is a, this is actually you mentioned cars and Taurus and Recall. Uh, By the way, I don't know. I just made up a, the first car that came to mind. I'm not saying there's actually a, no, 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 no. Any Taurus drivers out there? If you just got a little nervous, no, don't. I don't. <laughs> don't. I have no idea. But one of the things that uh, happened to us a couple of years ago was that we had a X5, and the X5 caught on fire after my wife had turned it off in in our garage and basically caught our house on fire. And things worked out just fine. But of course, the car was destroyed. And at that point, my wife said, I am never buying another BMW again, which I supported because, you know, we bought it for the safety factor because we had a little girl and we wanted her to be as safe as possible. And that car was really safe. Sure. But now when they so pull into the, like the parking lot at Target or wherever they're going, my daughter will say, don't park next to the fire car, mommy. <laughs> so they refuse to park next to BMWs. That is a part to whole flaw right there. However, it is one that I fully support since I will no longer park next to the meter. <laughs> it almost has an overgeneralization feel to it as well. Kind of like my friend got shortchanged at that store, so they rip everybody off. It's that it does. The you problem know, was is we field. went online and discovered that BMW engine fires are not exactly uncommon. Ooh. And that was where we were like, yeah, we're not parking next to them. Anyway, let's move on. <laughs> Before we do, let me, uh, let me actually make an additional point here. Uh, okay. Because we lump these two together because obviously they are so close in nature in terms of what they do, just up versus down. But people need to be very careful about distinguishing one from the other. Because I see trap answers of composition in division errors. And I see division trap answers in composition errors. This is one of their favorite things to do. So just because you see a part to whole type or a whole to part type of flaw, make sure you read the answer for the exact up or down nature of what you did in fact encounter. Because wrong answers will have that same, what is true of the whole must be true of the parts, or what's true of the parts must be true of the whole. You make sure you're going in the right direction because they will get you if you're just looking for those words. Yeah, and once you see that you have one of these errors, you want to look for answers that have part or whole or some kind of reference or s synonymous term, but then you need to double check and make sure it says exactly what you want it to say. Yeah, it's funny because I was thinking, as soon as it has those words, read all five and make sure it's actually going the right direction. Yeah, I, yesterday when I was thinking about this topic, I wanted to make that same point, so I'm really glad that you came back oh, to it because I okay. had obviously spaced out. <laughs> <laughs> it's easy to do, painkiller. <laughs> you think that's the cause? You know, can can I, I ask know. you we'll do reliably, causal flaws later? Can you tell me what's in a painkiller? Uh, any earthly idea? I'm gonna guess. I know it's tropical, so I'm gonna guess rum. Rum, indeed. And orange juice. There is orange juice in there. I'm running out quickly. Coconut I, and pineapple. Oh, that makes sense. Usually sure. cream of coconut, like cocos or something like gotcha. that. Technically, though, the painkiller is trademarked in the United States by the owners of Pusser's Rum. So a true painkiller can only have Pusser's Rum. And so I okay. guess I'm drinking a faux painkiller because I do not have Pusser's. That type. I do not have Pusser's. I have uh, Myers. Sorry. That's all right. How about that? <laughs> Tough um, luck. <laughs> I thought for the longest time that a dark and stormy had to have Gosling's dark rum in it, but I was wrong. I think Isn't it supposed to? I mean, it's supposed to, but I don't think it's trademarked in the same way like painkiller TM is. It's funny because my wife asked me last night what was in a dark and stormy, and I nailed it. And I think she was stunned because she couldn't things. remember. And she's she's the one that has like superior uh, cocktail making she knowledge to me. Yeah, to be sure. I was like, this podcast is making me drink a lot more, so I'm really on top of my drinks. <laughs> yeah, I've got to start expensing this stuff. It's getting really expensive. <laughs> Absolutely not. <laughs> uh, maybe it's working with you that's causing me to drink a lot. Let's little find out. A, little column B. Let's talk about the next one. <laughs> this is uncertain use of a term or concept, often called equivocation. Mm -hmm. It means using a term in different ways instead of keeping it constant. 
Um, there's a ton of examples that kind of display this. Um, one of the great LSAT examples, if it uses the word value, and one of it is in a monetary sense. And then when they talk later, the value is like in a moral sense. Right. And so that's, that's a really good one that's out there. John, I think you've got a couple of good examples of this too. I do. Let me, uh, let me go back just a step and explain in the more abstract or the broader sense how this works. So essentially, it can either be one speaker talking about some idea or a central idea or term or something, and it changes, shifts in meaning or definition or use, or even two people having a conversation which is where you see this a lot of times. And whether deliberate or unintentional, the second speaker will take a part of what that first person has said, but use a central term in it um, with a different meaning or a different type of implication. That's what, how this works. And again, I think it's best illustrated in certain examples. You see this a lot, before I get into some of the examples you and I, I know throw around, you see this a lot with words that can be used in multiple ways. You use the word value. Value can mean things like appreciate or actual cost, monetary quantity cost. The word appreciate is another word that actually can be used in multiple ways as, it, as I think about it. So if I said, for instance, to somebody, I was like, look, I'm really trying to grow my own personal wealth here. So I want to make sure that I invest in things that will appreciate more than my current holdings. And the next guy looks at me and says, why can't you just be grateful for what you have? I'm like, that's not what I meant by appreciate, dude. Appreciate <laughs> means to grow in value, but it also means to be grateful. That that's, guy's reading comprehension needs to be improved. Yeah, that, no, that would be a pretty bad miss. But that's <laughs> yeah. one way that this can work, right? Yeah, and if you think about this, when you put it in that context and you realize how much of this is English contextually based – especially people who are out of the country or who are who basically don't have English as their primary language where it's a second language, this is the kind of question that can really cause them problems because it's so nuanced. This is a pure language flaw, unlike a lot of the other ones that we've talked about. Um, another one I've actually seen is around the word climate, which can mean obviously like the atmosphere, or it can mean the more general feeling and tone in some scenario or situation. So if I said something like, you know, today's political climate is full of varied opinions and, you know, competing views. And somebody came back and they're like, actually, dude, the science is clear and uniform. Global warming's a thing. It's like, that's not the climate I was talking about. <laughs> so words like mm -hmm. that, again, they have to hinge. It's the old Socrates quote, right? Like the beginning of wisdom is the definition of terms. That's really what this is. If two people are going to use the same word in different ways to mean different things, the argument never even gets off the ground. I'll give you a, or, a simpler example in a second, but or. One of them will start with a reasonable statement, but the rebuttal then would never yeah. get off the ground. Both of the rebuttals that I just gave, for instance, appreciation, climate, yeah. uh, are uh, clearly have missed the point. It can spike the entire argument or it can spike the response. It depends upon how they structure it. That's I think right. that's the key thing. Yeah, it's a really good point. Um, there's an example that I have stolen from another instructor that you and I both know, a guy named Jay down in Irvine. Jay, if you're listening to this, thanks. I've uh, shamelessly, shamelessly taken this from you because <laughs> it's a good one. Two guys having a conversation. The first guy's just hanging his head, clearly like just depressed. He says, oh man, I don't know what I'm going to do. I can't afford to feed my kids. The next guy in surprise, startled, says, well, what are you talking about? You can't afford not to feed your kids which is just a beautiful illustration of this. In this case, the use of the word afford has changed. Exactly. First guy, I don't senses. have the ability, the financial ability to keep my kids fed. And the next guy's like, you have a moral responsibility to feed your kids. You can't afford it's, not to. You've got this obligation. That's right. And so it is the same word or idea, but it is coming across in two very different ways. And I think there's a question that uh, we both are pretty familiar with that also does this. Sure. And it's a question, if you want to go back and look at how the LSAT would do this in a stimulus, uh, one of the great examples of all time is Prep Test 19, which is the June 1996 LSAT. It's the first question in the first logical reasoning section. <laughs> and essentially what they do is they, they misuse the word exploit. And they use it in one way. And then they use it in a different way. And I think you'd paraphrased it before as something along the lines of, you know, to maximize revenue, we must exploit 
every available resource. And then there's a response that comes in and says, no, our employees are our most valuable resource. We have strict policies against exploiting our employees. Right. And that is different than the actual stimulus, which is a little bit more formalized. Yeah. And I've simplified it a little bit. I use this example in class a lot because it's a little more LSAT centric than a guy who can't feed his kids. You think? <laughs> I mean, <laughs> ah, just a little I bit. Hope. Yeah, I hope. This yeah, one but... to me is a little subtler too because it's, they both seem to make good points, interestingly. Yeah, in that stimulus, the way it actually plays out, it's uh, it's the director of manufacturing right. who is talking about uh, you know what's going on and and a management consultant, and so it's like this person says this, then the consultant doesn't reply, but statements are attributed to that person, and so then it comes down to the word exploit, and when you look at that, you realize that you know the. First statement is to maximize, you know, exploit resources really to maximize the, your utility of them. And then the second is to is exploit as in the the idea of take advantage of. Right. right. Very different type of ideas. Mistreat or abuse. Though. Yeah. Yeah. It's like your appreciate example there before. Mm -hmm. And then you get down to the answers and problems like this, and you're dealing with the idea of key terms or inconsistency. And so you get answers like fails to distinguish two different senses. Uh, of a key term, depending on ambiguous usage, confuses meanings is another phrase that they use. Equivocates with respect to a central term or central concept. You even exactly. called this the era of equivocation when we kicked it off. And they, exactly. they like that word. For those of you who don't know what equivocate means, it means to move back and forth between basically two positions or two points. Yeah. An unequivocal st uh, statement is one that is certain. Singular. So one that is equivocal is uncertain. It's kind of how I always looked at it. There you go. They're moving back forth. Yeah. My, fo lessons, my phone man. just buzzed with a Verizon update that my iPhone is on the way. <laughs> You're the today's, happiest person in the world. Today's a good day. <laughs> uh, this is my Christmas, basically. Every year I get a new iPhone, and that's my little treat for me. If you could marry Apple Corporation, I believe that you would. Uh, you kind of have. <laughs> Who was it that said companies are people? I could make they a case are. for this. Yeah. Is it Mitt Romney or something? In business law, they are. <laughs> it is its own legal entity. There you go. That's that's the closest you'll ever see me get to marriage, I think. So you say. So I say. <laughs> I'll leave it at that. Yeah. Uh, Challenge let's move accepted? On. Is that what you're thinking? What's that? Challenge accepted? No, so not really. <laughs> you do what you want to do. I don't really care. It's the truest statement we'll make today. I mean, I care. I just, I it, it doesn't matter to me in the long run you. whether or not you're single, married, whatever. Fair enough. You probably go out more when you're single, though. Uh, yeah, probably. No, there's no probably about okay. it. Fair enough. I've known you a long time. I've really toned it down <laughs> since Big John's went out of business. <laughs> <laughs> Your grandma. My grandma consumption has plummeted. Yeah. Dude, that tree they had <laughs> with the Grand Marnier bottles was spectacular. Really I remember being incredible. in awe of it and saying that to Maria. And she's like, oh, yeah, I got that for them. They're like one of the top bars in America for selling grandma. And I was like, how is this possible? Yeah. This place is a crap hole. Yeah, it was rough. <laughs> All right, let's move on to a false analogy. Yeah, I love this flaw. Yeah, I think this is a great one. You want to do the open or you want me to? Sure. This is another one uh, a little bit like uncertain use of a term or a concept where you're probably going to encounter it more as a, a wrong answer. Certainly with uncertain use, the one we just did, that tends to appear less frequently as the real flaw and more frequently as a trap. It's one of those things that even if you see it, oftentimes it'll stop people in their tracks and force them to go back and reread to see like, wait, did something change here? So be on the lookout for it. When you encounter it as an error, you should know whether it was there or not. False analogy, same thing. Um, yeah, I'll, I'll happily take the intro here. So false analogy flaw. This is essentially when an author uses an analogy or makes a comparison that is either too dissimilar, too unlike what the original situation was to be applicable. Um, basically, the assumption in this that becomes false is that just because two things are potentially alike in some way, that they have to be alike either in other ways or alike in totality. And they could differ in certain places. They could have a small degree of overlap, but the Venn diagram is largely separate, that kind of thing. 
Yeah. That's what a false analogy is. And it's interesting because when you look at the use of analogies on this test, in general, LSAC has said, we think analogies are fine yeah. as long as they are appropriate. And if you think about what an analogy is, it's really trying to shed light on a situation by comparing it to another situation that you might be more familiar with. And you can then more easily see what the relationships are between the various pieces. That's so right. That's right. it's a comparative thing. And a false analogy runs into a problem because they might be alike in some respects, but they are also dissimilar in key yeah. respects. Yeah. The truth of X holds also for Y because X and Y are similar enough that I can cross apply my knowledge. And again, that might be true. Um, I've talked about this in assumption questions that have analogies in them. The assumption answer choice is very often just that the author believes the analogy holds. The author believes these two things are similar enough to compare. Yeah. That is the assumption in analogy. So if you see an analogy in an assumption question, that answer choice is very likely to crop up. In a false analogy, of course, the problem is we don't know enough to make the comparison. Which means that when you have a flaw question, a lot of times the answer, just to jump, you know, to put the, the cart before the horse, mm. is that the two situations are treated as if they're similar when in fact they are not. Sure. Or that there are differences that the author has actually missed out on. Yeah. So, just as you say, your assumption is the author thought they were the same, the flaw then becomes they weren't similar enough. So, you have to look at the comparison uh, and see what it is. But there's plenty of examples of false analogies that we can toss at you. Um, sure. One of the most famous ones revolves around drinking coffee versus uh, <laughs> drinking versus, alcohol. Versus us? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Between us. I do not drink much coffee myself, but... I think you try, you drink more coffee than I do. Yeah, I had a cup this morning. I'm very rare. Well, let me tell you something. People who need a drink every day are no worse than coffee drinkers because coffee drinkers can't start their day without their morning cup. So is that really true? Just because they both need a drink of something each day, right. does, that, does that analogy really hold? I mean, I need water too, right? Yeah, but... And so we see there's some similarities. Yeah, you're taking in liquid, it's a regular occurrence, but coffee and alcohol have very different effects on the body. Sure. Not to say that, you know, 15 drinks and 15 cups of coffee, they both end in disaster. <laughs> <laughs> Let's put it that way. Heart I don't attack want anyone to coma? go test it. Is that what, yeah. Uh, yeah, this <laughs> a part of the reason I don't drink coffee is I just don't like the taste, but you drink too much of it and it makes me feel jittery. Yeah, I can get a little wired up too. Um, man, there's just dozens and dozens of these we could do. We won't, but to throw a few more out there, um, something like, oh, my friend's a vegetarian, so he must be a picky eater. That's a false analogy. You can be a vegetarian and have a wide palate for things. There's a lot of vegetables out there. Yeah, is it vegetarian and being a picky eater? These are two different different things, but are they similar enough to say, oh, you know, yeah. you're just going to make them Can you use equivalent? this one truth to conclude something slightly different? No. Not in this case. Um, or one that I've actually heard before. People who don't tip, they're basically stealing. They're thieves. You stole from her if you don't tip. It's like, all right. Like, I didn't tip, but does that make him a thief? That's not necessarily an analogous behavior. Makes you a total jerk. No, no, you're, you're, yeah, I don't want to go out with you. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but are you a thief? And that's where a lot of these things go, is they'll take some behavior and almost like magnify it or, or find some almost unnatural or extreme um, comparison element. Or comparison exactly. Behavior. You hear this all the time when people talk about the human brain. Mm -hmm. The human brain is a computer. No, it's not. You know, it does it does some processing functions, but it is so different than a computer that trying to compare the two is, is a challenge. But that's a false analogy right there. Yeah. And you could easily see how you could build a stimulus around like a neurological discussion and a computer discussion, then have an answer that says, treats the two cases uh, that are different as if they were similar and end up with a correct answer in something like that. Yeah. A cell is like a little city, is an example I remember from biology course, classes, and I was kind of like, if you mean like scattered comings and goings and compartmentalized parts, sure. But there's a degree of organization in a city that cells don't actually contain. It's mostly just random behavior and hormones. 
these are where things break down. Now, I don't think they would get into something like that on the LSAT because it requires a molecular knowledge that people wouldn't be expected to have. But this is the problem with a lot of analogies. The other problem is people love analogies. It's one of their love favorite things to do because it helps to illustrate points. If done it's probably correctly. my favorite way to teach, yeah. to be honest with you. In class, I'm usually just throwing out analogy after analogy because it's fun, especially when you, you, know, you come up with a really great one on the spot. Sure. But also a lot of times someone would be like, I don't understand this relationship between these power plants and electrical production. And then you analogize it to burgers and fries and somebody's like, oh, I get it. Yeah. And it makes it a lot clearer to see that relationship because humans are designed so that when you already understand the context of something, you can much more easily pick up the relationships. Whereas when you are presented with a new situation that you don't know a whole lot about, you have to first struggle to grasp the basics of what's being talked about before yeah. you can look at the relationships between those pieces. Yeah. A simpler analogy, if you get the mechanics of that, it's easier to scale up a lot of times. Now, I picked on Trump earlier. Let me pick on Obama real quick. Since today's okay. clearly got a political bent. And we can do more after this one, but or we can we can move on after this. But I remember at one point when he was really pushing uh, the Affordable Care Act and health care, he said, basically, my plan will require that everyone has to have personal health insurance. I must do it. It's a mandate. He said, it's just like every state requiring drivers have car insurance. And I remember hearing that even back in the day and thinking to myself, is it though? Isn't car insurance largely to protect other people? In the event of an accident or some problem? Is it though? This is where analogies often break down. And, and I will say this, and maybe you think this is too strong. No analogy is perfect. There's always, if you want to really get microscopic with things, there's almost always something you can pick that differentiates the two in some way. It's going to be some imperfection at some yeah. point, even though it might be really small. Yeah. There's always a difference. That's what the whole point is, is that you're comparing one thing to something different and saying, I'm going to use these similarities to teach myself something about right. it. Right. The key to this particular flaw is that the differences are significant or substantial enough that the, the relevance of one truth doesn't necessarily have to apply, cross-apply to the other case. That's what you need here. So you need these differences to be large enough. Well, I'm going to close this part of the discussion out with okay. a really cool quote that I happened to run across. And it's from a New York Times article from over a decade ago. And it was a guy actually writing about the SAT, which is where I first encountered this. And they were talking about, at that time, removing analogies from the SAT. <laughs> and what he said was, the power of an analogy is that it can persuade people to transfer the feeling of certainty they have about one subject to another subject about which they have not formed an opinion. But these analogies are often undependable because of the dissimilarities that we have. And that's exactly the problem with a false analogy is they're saying, well, I'm comparing this to that. And you know a lot about one, so you feel comfortable. But that doesn't mean that every part is transferable. And that's where we get the breakdown. That's a perfect quote. Yeah. I like awesome. it. Awesome. Let's move on. Uh, to the other of the, the big deal heavy hitter flaws today which is a false dilemma. And this has lots of different names in logic. Uh, a false dichotomy, as it's sometimes called, black and white fallacy. Um, this is, and I'll touch on the intro and let you expand on it. This is essentially what happens when an author constrains or restricts the potential outcomes uh, or decisions to too few cases, to fewer cases than may in fact exist. That's exactly right. And typically on the LSAT, you see it as this either or proposition mm -hmm. that has been uh, falsely constructed. We're either doing this or we're doing that. Yeah, you know, I always think of that, th this flaw is the my way or the highway <laughs> kind of flaw, where it's like, these are the only two choices. Right. But are they really? Yeah. And there's a million examples of things like that. But what's happening here is, is that there's often multiple outcomes in any given situation. And so the first thing that I will say is that there are some situations in which there are only two possible outcomes. Naturally binary. Yeah. Yeah. I'm either in California or I'm not in California. And again, I don't want someone to be like, I'm standing on the state line. Go away. <laughs> <Okay. Yeah. laughs> I'm not listening to you. 
Uh, we're just going to talk about that not existing for the moment. But basically, you're either in California or not in California, or you're trying to irritate me. And so <laughs> that kind of like binary construct. But notice they, what you've just done. You've actually created a logical opposition in that. I have. Logical opposition exists by definition. By dividing the world into two parts, it creates – everything is either a potato or it isn't. Yeah. That's true. That is true. So when you talk about like logical opposition in that case, then yeah, that's one thing. What we're talking about though are situations that may not be binary. Yes, and let's go on from there because cool. the, the fact is, is some scenarios are binary, but there are many others that are not. And so – when you run into this on the LSAT, a lot of times what you will see is a speaker saying something to the effect of, well, we either can't do this, so obviously we must do this other thing. Right. Or alternatively, we must do this, so obviously we can't do this other thing. It goes either way, where you're saying that it has to be one of the two, and it's only that way. Right. And in almost every case, the problem that you've run into here is you've improperly assumed that those were the only two outcomes. Well, they tell you, mistakenly, that, listen, we're either going to raise taxes or we're going to cut spending to save money this year. Well, look, we can't raise taxes, people will riot, so we're going to have to cut spending. Yep. And it's like, maybe there was a third option there, though. Or that was really the only ways to do it. Um, this is where the flaw exists. So, you, yeah, this duality that gets basically propped up at first, take one of the legs out and the other leg's all you've got left. But it's like, maybe there's a third leg or a fourth or a tenth. Yeah, and you end up with answers like improperly concludes uh, that a limited number of courses of action are available. Yeah. Something like that, which takes a really easy flaw to understand and turns it into something that sounds kind of vaguely irritating <laughs> that you have there. But there's – when you just go through pop culture, you have so many examples yeah. of this. I, I, to me, a lot of times the giveaway with this, aside from just the duality, the two-road construct, is the absolute nature of how the author concludes things. Well, we've lost this option, so this is all we have left. It's that old Obi-Wan Kenobi quote about only a Sith deals in absolutes. That's what I tend to think of with this. <laughs> because, again, you have to be careful. You have to be a little more open-minded. Let's give some examples. You want to do one? Uh, I'll give you one based kind of on my own personal life. Okay. Uh, <laughs> When you have a child, it's just something like, oh, you know, daddy, please buy me this. If you don't buy it, you don't love me. <laughs> now, fortunately, my daughter's never said that quite, but she certainly like intimated slightly that I would be a bad person for not buying her. Oh, the, she's slicker than just you don't love me, daddy. <laughs> she's, she's very sharp. Yes, yeah, she is. But that kind of thing where it's like you either buy this or I know that you don't love me, that's not the only two options here, clearly. <laughs> I, sh I know you got a few too. Yeah. One of the ones I've heard sadly from educated friends before is, well, the doctors can't explain my mom's recovery. It must have been a miracle. It's like, maybe, maybe it was a miracle. Maybe all the laws of nature basically denied themselves to align in your particular favor here or your mom's. Or maybe there's another explanation. Maybe the doctors are lacking information maybe we just haven't reached a point to be able to understand this. Maybe it was a miracle. A Things lot of like different that. outcomes. What's that? A lot of different outcomes there. A lot of different potential explanations or causes in that case, yeah. Um, to land on a single one definitively really ignores opposite or alternative possibilities. And that's the falsehood of this dilemma. That's exactly right. There's a lot of quotes. You're my way or the highway. Um, America, love it or leave it. <laughs> so that reminds me actually of a story that goes right along with this. I remember years ago at some family gathering, um, me whining, griping about some recent political development, as I tend to do because I'm off-putting. And from across the room, I hear my grandmother say to me, well, why don't you just move to Canada then? And I remember thinking to myself, number one, how self-defeating is that? Like, I'm going to voluntarily like, give away my right to have a political influence by voting. I think what I actually said to her is like, I'd miss you too much. <laughs> but I remember in my head hearing like, that's a real stupid thing for you to say. <laughs> I wish I'd been there. <laughs> <laughs> that's a false dilemma type of thing. You don't like it? Get out. Oh, man. <laughs> I'm going to leave that alone. Sure. You're either with us or against us. A lot of these little bumper sticker types of slogans, they're, uh, they create a 
binary situation that doesn't have to be binary. I'd rather die on my feet than live on my knees. That's right. Give me liberty or give me death. How about just a sandwich? <laughs> <laughs> give me something else. You know? Give me comfort. Give me compromise. <laughs> give me a drink, man. <laughs> there you go. Above all. So over and over you see this sort of thing. There's an old Tolstoy quote that I'm probably going to butcher uh, about like there, there can be no peace for us. It's only misery or the greatest happiness. And again, it's one of those things that's like, dude, I get your point that you're trying to make. Like, it's one or the other, given our Russian scenario here. But these are the types that is, though. I know. It's really subtle. I really like that quote. And I'm going to jump in because from an LSAT standpoint, you could see how you could construct a question around this. Mm -hmm. The first part of that was, you know, there can be no peace. You could create a question where it's like, well, we can't do this. We can't do this. So we only have these two choices. And it starts to sound something, to sound very reasonable because you're like, well, they couldn't do these two options. And so all of a sudden it has to be one of these last two standing options. Right. And at that point you have a false dilemma. You don't know that you're down to just two options just because you eliminated two others. So, that's a great quote. I think that's Anna Karenina, but don't quote me on it. Don't quote I'm me on my quote. I'm not a Tolstoy fan, so I will not. All right. I don't Maybe like some anything. listener can chime in and tell me I've butchered it. Tolstoy is tedious to me. <laughs> <laughs> There's so many great so writers historically yeah, I that I don't like to spend my time on. <laughs> a lot of the Russian writers are, are problematic for me. Yeah, that's fair. Um, but that's how this, this falls to the morning. So watch out for absolute language always, of course. But watch out for an author making an absolute determination or conclusion based off simply eliminating one of two alternative things. That's usually how this is built. Be open-minded to the possibility that more things could exist. All right. Let's move on. Cool. Let's move on to one that I actually like quite a bit that is often called the relativity flaw. Sometimes you hear it called a comparative flaw. A degree flaw. I've heard this called as well. Yes. And so what happens here <laughs> is that typically in a relativity flaw, you're given some information about a relative relationship. Oftentimes, you know, uh, one that compares one, one thing to another. And then on the basis of that relative relationship, they attempt to draw an absolute overall conclusion. You know, so one of the, the simple examples here is that, uh, uh, you know, Mary is the tallest child in her preschool. So she's a tall child in general that's automatically questionable as a tall child because being in preschool, you're relatively, you're really small. Mm -hmm. And so this kind of like relative information, she's the tallest in the class, is then used to be absolute in its conclusion. She's tall in general. Yeah. You, can't, you can't make that kind of leap. And so you can go either way too. You can, you can come around and, and start off with information where it's just like you know that it is a absolute. Like this person is tall and then go on from there and make some type of relative uh, relationship. So they're clearly taller than all the people that I know. Yeah, all my they're friends. taller than me then or they're tallest in the group. This is not to turn this into a grammar lesson because you can already feel people reaching for the mute switch. Uh, but in English, there are three degrees essentially of descriptors. There's what we call the positive degree, which is just where you describe someone as is. Mary's tall. There's the comparative degree. Mary's taller than Jane. And then there's the superlative degree, where Mary's the tallest one in the room. And you cannot jump between degrees. One tall, does tall, not tallest. necessarily guarantee in either direction. Just because she's the tallest in the room doesn't make her tall. Just because she's tall doesn't mean she's taller than Jane. You cannot jump between these three different positions in any direction. And that's essentially where this relativity flaw occurs. That's exactly where it occurs. Yeah. And if you think about that tall, taller, and tallest kind of relationship, all of a sudden you can begin to think about how could you make arguments with that information that would be problematic for yeah. test takers. Now, I want to put a small asterisk on this. There are scenarios you could construct where you could move between them. Like, if Mary is tall, she'll be the tallest in the room. Or Mary's the tallest in the room, so she's taller than Jane, who's standing beside her. These are things you can do, but you have to be very careful about taking, like, individual things and jumping around. So be mindful of this. It's a dangerous you have game. To, 
you have to limit the scenario and yes. the information so that it is not so broad to be flawed. Yeah. In this case, you're limiting it to just the people in the room, for example. You're not generalizing. Or I created a conditional in the first example there. If you're exactly. tall, you'll be the tallest in the school, that kind of thing. Um, but it takes that degree of specificity before you can actually move between degrees. Yeah, there's a lot of different ways to set up arguments in this way that are both flawed and valid. So just because you have a comparison doesn't automatically mean that an argument is flawed. There's plenty of arguments with comparisons that are completely reasonable. So you have to look at this and say, all right, there is a comparison. How good is the comparison that's being made? Does it actually stand up? Yeah. You'll give a few more examples. Um, she is the team's best player. So she must be great. Wow, she must be really good. So you start off with a relative relationship. She's the team's best player. So she's, relatively speaking, she's the best player on the team. Does that then mean that overall she's a great player? Yeah. Can we say something singular, superlative about her? Not necessarily. That team could really suck. That's exactly the case. <laughs> I've been watching a lot of six-year-old soccer recently. <laughs> yeah. Uh, <laughs> and the best player out there is not Mia Hamm. <laughs> <laughs> I've seen some teams out there where the best player is not so great. Oh, Mia Hamm reference. I just dated myself, didn't I? Y yes, you did. I could have picked anybody from the most recent World Cup winners. I went with Mia Hamm. <laughs> <laughs> Who wasn't even on the team. <laughs> no, dude. She's like <laughs> 60. Uh, uh, they live in the biggest house in town. Wow. They must have a mansion. Maybe. Not if it's a shanty town. That's right. You know, Maybe. Um, be bad again, news. another relative premise. The relationship there is comparative. It's the biggest house in town. But to draw an absolute conclusion from it, you have to be really careful. We don't know enough to say that. In a town full of mansions, they have the biggest one. That's different. That is different. Yes. We'll do one more in that same vein where it's, it starts off with a relative relationship. Cool. Um, the company made more money this year than ever before, so clearly we're doing extremely well. Well, what if you lost money the last five years and this year you finally made $3? Right. Does that mean you're doing very well? No, it does not. It means you're doing better than you were before. So the relative truth is there, but not this absolute all of a sudden we're doing well just because we've improved our position. Yeah, and that's where these flaws live and the potential exceptions to what the authors concluded. I really like that example, Dave, because instead of comparing two different things, you've kept it to the same company and just compared different years. That's cool. Yeah. The thing like about that. with you could do this inside of grades too. Oh, I got a better grade on this history <laughs> test than the last history test, so I'm going to ace this course. That's right. Uh, what if you went from a D to a C? <laughs> yeah, that A is a little probably not happening. Yeah. It's not on the horizon. Yeah, my parents are going to be so proud. Well, <laughs> I've improved. Well, yeah. They appreciate your improvement, however they wish for excellence. That's right. <laughs> it doesn't have to always go this way, though, from a comparative up to an individualized superlative or absolute. You can go the other directions. We touched on that before, but let's give another example of it. So if I said something to you like, dude, my friend is wicked smart, crazy smart. So given, is, is given and yeah, known to be intelligent. This guy is sharp as a tack. So he's going to be the valedictorian. What have I done? Yeah. And valedictorian is one of those tricky words where if you don't think about it enough, it seems like an individual accomplishment, but it's not. It's a relative accomplishment. That is right. Yeah. You have just become the best out of your class. That's right. Just because you're smart doesn't mean you're the smartest in that group or have the best grades in that group, et cetera. Perfect. Yeah. I had a friend who graduated from a high school where it was extremely small. It's hard to call it a high school, but each of the graduating classes was like seven or eight people. Oh, wow. It was, it was one of the, it was a religious school. And so everything was very tiny. And all of a sudden they were talking about valedictorians and salutatorians. And I was like, out of eight people. That's yes, the third year group. <laughs> <laughs> like, okay, this was, at that point, you could have been a valedictorian and really not have been that great overall. Yeah, the bell curve just looked like a triangle, basically. <laughs> <laughs> it was a mountainous. Yeah. That's crazy. Uh, I, had, I thought I had a small class at 32 or something. Yeah. You went to a pretty small high school. I did. Overall. I went to a high school where there was like 570 people in my graduating class. Wow. Yeah. My parents thought it'd keep me out of trouble. 
They were wrong. Talking about flaws. <laughs> let's, go, let's go to the last flaw here. You feel comfortable with that? I do. Yeah. I, partly because I was looking forward to this last flaw a lot. I think this is a cool one to talk about. This is actually probably one of my favorites just in life because yeah. I think it's a really good one to think about as you kind of go through decision-making processes. I will say, I don't think this comes up quite as much as some of the others we've talked about here, but it is interesting. And if you happen to see it and catch it, well, you're welcome. Yeah, it's one of those things. I have seen it on the test before. Uh, it is not highly frequent, but it's also one of those ones where it's just good to think about, is this a flaw or a fallacy in terms of the way people think? This might be this, the best life lesson of the day, perhaps. I would agree with you on that 100%, other than <laughs> having learned what the contents of a painkiller are. True. That's a great life lesson for everybody. <laughs> so this is called the sunk cost fallacy, also known as the Concord fallacy. Which we'll talk which about. relates to an old airplane. But you often will see this when it relates to investment of various entities. And I don't necessarily mean time or money. It can or or money. It could be time as well. It could be investment in terms of a relationship. It could be emotional. It could be almost anything where you've put in effort. Yeah. And what happens here is that a lot of times decisions are made and they're not based upon what the future value is of what you're looking at, but what the past investment was. Uh, Vietnam to me is, is a great example of a sunk cost fallacy because people were like, well, we've already put this many people on the ground. We've already lost this, this many lives. Mm -hmm. We can't pull out now. We'll lose face. And they were, these were all sunk costs. They needed to make a decision on going forward, and instead they incrementally increased their involvement until they were in the midst of a massive quagmire. Yeah. This is also why it's sometimes called the gambler's fallacy. Yes. <laughs> you see this. You see poker players, not the great ones, but the amateur ones, stay in a hand and just keep betting and betting, even though the chances of them winning that hand are so small because they've already put so much in. I can't well, if you're fold now. If you're a poker player and you've put the big blind in and then you have a terrible hand, you really want to get that that money back. Right. And so you're like, ah, I better I, – I, I might need to play this out. The appropriate response is not to look at the money that you put in but to say, what can I get out of this? Is there a possible return? Mm -hmm. And what's the chances of this? Yep. Yeah, the chance might be 1% that you could get your money back with this hand – that's not a good reason to go forward. Right. You just have to cut your losses. That's the, this is the throwing good money after bad idea. That's exactly what people actually will talk about. Chase and, the stock to the bottom. Yeah, <laughs> over and over. Yeah. I, lo I love the gambler's fallacy description of this and, and the poker example in particular because anybody who's ever played cards would say, oh man, I've already put out that much. I want to get it back. I got to tell you, I mean, not my proudest admission, but I've committed this many, many times over the years. I'm like, ah, what's another 10 bucks? Dude, what's I just 20? committed it on Sunday in <laughs> NFL betting. Nice. Uh, we were irritated by a loss that never should have been a loss. And so then we decided, uh, you know, we're going to bet on the next game because we're going to get it back. Right. And it, it really wasn't rational. We were just irritated <laughs> by what had happened in the incredibly stupid uh, Denver-Chicago game. I have no more comments about the referees in that game. But anyway, <laughs> that was one of those things where we were being driven by the fact that we just lost, especially because we should have won yeah. by all by all rights. And so then all of a sudden we said, all right, we're going to bet this next game. Yeah. Which was, I mean, it happens. Eagles we're all – I mean, this to me is one of the biggest, hardest traps to avoid just day to day. It's so easy to look at something and be like, I got to stay in. Yeah, but some of you might be thinking, well, yeah, I'm not betting on the NFL, Dave, and I'm not playing poker. You drink and gamble. I'm wondering about your moral character. Uh, so I don't have this problem in my life. And I would say to you, I bet you do. Yeah. If you ever gone like out to dinner and then you've ordered an expensive meal and you get to near the end and you're like, I'm really full. But then you decide, yeah, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to eat the rest of this because I don't want to waste the money that I spent. That right there is a sunk cost fallacy. The money's been spent on dinner. You're not getting it back. Is the value of eating that last bit of steak or whatever it is right. worth it? No. You go home and you're like, I'm too full. And you lay on the couch instead of going out and having fun. Yeah. Yeah. This and is why buffets ruin people. <laughs> yeah. They're like, I got to get my extra value, yeah, you know, right. more crab legs because I paid yeah. $19.99 at Red Lobster. Give them to me now or Give whatever it, it is. Right. 
Um, yeah, binge watching TV. Uh, you know, I'm, I'm four episodes in, and this really isn't doing it for me. But I am four episodes in. I'll finish the season. Yeah, I want to see how I'm gonna. I'm gonna see how it goes, even though I know it's terrible because I've already spent time really on not it. enjoying this. But I mean, gosh, there's only four more episodes to go. I might as well finish. So. Or let's just go back to anybody's, you know, last failed relationship. Did it last longer than it should have? In a lot of cases, it does. And what happens? Let's say you've been going out with somebody for a couple of years, and you get to that point where you're like, "Well, we have such history together. You know, we've invested so much time, right. and I know you so well." These are all sunk costs. You're not getting that time back. And instead of saying, well, what's the possibility of the future? You're like, well, I really don't want to lose all this effort that I've invested in this person. It would force me to start again. Well, sometimes it's better to start again. Yeah. I'll go ahead and say, I don't think I've ever been in a relationship that broke up when it should have. It always came way too late. Later than it should. Are you trying to tell us something here? I'm telling you that I tend to hang on to things longer than I know I should. (laughs) Uh, yeah because i look and it's also easy to just keep doing the same thing i'm not even talking about relationships anymore it's like yeah i'm just gonna go to the buffet again i'm gonna keep watching this show because it's there that's not quite what this fallacy is this isn't a fallacy of complacency necessarily or a fallacy of consistency it's a fallacy of hindsight or um nostalgia almost it's you it's not inertial it's using the yeah. past to influence your current decision in an inappropriate way right this is not to say that the past can't have an effect you learn things from the past that can affect your decision but honestly when you've ordered an expensive meal and you decide <laughs> to clean your plate just because you're like i want to get my money's worth you may actually be hurting yourself just to kind of like capture this idea that is a sunk cost yeah, fallacy right i enjoyed there. that less than i should than i could have um to put away anyone who's still scratching their head over why it's called the concord fallacy maybe we should talk about that because it's another classic example of good money after bad uh you probably know more about this than i do although i know a little bit yeah well first off the concord was a plane a <laughs> supersonic plane it was a jet, ultra fast baby. yeah yeah, it, I can't remember what the top speed was on that thing, but it broke the sound barrier. I think it was like over Mach 2. Was it Mach 2? I think 1.8, 2.1. It was, it, was, it was fast and it was loud. <laughs> <laughs> I know that, that the airports that uh, they allowed it to take off and land at got numerous complaints. Yeah, it needed custom runways and stuff. I think it was... It was also the super cool plane where the nose tilted down. Yeah, if you've never seen the off. Concorde, go look up some pictures of it. It was awesome. It was really it would a get very you across cool the plane. Atlantic, it was like New York to London in three hours or something, if not less, maybe less. I thought it was like two thirty or two forty or something like that. So it was obviously very elite kind of thing, and it and it had been built by a consortium of British and French companies. The problem was, is in building this amazing plane, they spent so much more money than they expected. But every time the if the program went up before the government and they said, this has an incredible cost overruns, this has gone crazy, it would get justified by saying, well, we can't just stop now. Look at all the money we've spent. Mm-hmm. And so... It became slowly, it was a sunk cost fallacy that slowly morphed into the idea of, you could also call it a Concord fallacy, Mm -hmm. because this plane exemplified the nature of how that mistake had been made. It continued to get funding too, even though it was clear it was never going to make money. Yeah. They ended up building it, doing the whole nine yards. Running flights. And it was first class plus. Yeah, I never flew on it. So, oh, uh, yeah, it was before my time, unfortunately. But I mean, Mine this was as well, like, basically. This was so. like Dubai of airplanes, basically. It was <laughs> posh. When it's got a drop nose on it, you know it's a you know it's good cool plane. <laughs> so, but it went fast and it was super loud. So, it was kind of a cool thing. But the whole justification after all these cost overruns became well, we've already spent all this money, so we need to continue building it, even though there was no horizon or future where they made the money back or got any type of return on investment. They would have been better just stopping at losing, let's say, $5 billion instead of continuing on and what, and then ending up losing billions of dollars more on top of it. That's right. And that's the essence of a sunk cost or Concord fallacy. Yeah. Yeah. So, again, this is probably of the six that we've covered today, probably the least likely that you'd encounter. But the coolest one for your life. Well, I think maybe the coolest one to talk about, certainly. Definitely the most relevant one in terms of just day-to-day. Um, but it's another good one to be aware of. 
whether, again, whether it teaches you a lesson in your relationship. I see a lot of people out there texting breakup texts right now. <laughs> <laughs> Don't be my Concord fallacy. Right. I'm out. <laughs> <laughs> I hope we haven't ended any relationships prematurely. They wouldn't be premature then if that's the way the person felt. I guess so. I hope someone sends me a text that says, I actually sent this because I knew it was over. That was just the push the I needed, year. David. Yeah, thanks. I'd be like, I feel proud. <laughs> and you can say it was the most logical decision that you made today. Your your ex-partner won't feel great about it, but that's not our problem. You're such a robot in love. <laughs> uh, the Love Robot. It sounds like a great band name. Oh, yeah, I could get down with that. It probably sounds like a band name that plays like K-pop or J-pop. You and your J-pop. <laughs> I love that stuff. All, All right. right. You got anything else in terms of the flaws? No. The one thing I will point out is that so far we have not talked about conditional reasoning, causal reasoning, and numbers and percentages, which are really the three biggest forms of reasoning when it comes to flaws. But they each deserve their own episodes, and so we were not going to fit them in with flaws that show up a little bit less. And we'll handle those in more detail down the road. But for now, that ends the three-part magnum opus of covering all the flaws <laughs> that you will either see in the stimulus or in many cases in the incorrect answer choices on LSAT questions. Any final word, John? I think we're good, man. This has been fun. Like I said, this is a series I've been really looking forward to doing for well, since we started this whole... Oh, shenanigans. So, <laughs> shenanigans. <laughs> it's a great bar and restaurant. Get your flair. <laughs> All right. Let's go ahead and close it out. If you get a chance, please subscribe to this podcast on iTunes, Spotify, YouTube, or anywhere else you find it in the world. Give us a rating. And if you have questions, please send them to LSAT at powerscore.com or LSAT podcast at powerscore.com. I uh, hope everyone has a great week. Thanks so much for listening. Take care. 